and welcome to TV30, a program by the Government Information Service. I am your host for this episode, Joanne Norville, the Science and Technology Officer in the Department of Sustainable Development. Um, you may be aware that the Department of Sustainable Development is currently pursuing a project to develop a marine litter management action plan which would address the issues of marine litter in St. Lucia, in and around St. Lucia. Um, under this project, we have a seminar actually coming up in October, which will involve a wide range of stakeholders and help bring the message to the public on how we can address the issues of marine litter in our country. So more about that later in the program, but let me introduce Mr. Vishnu Tulsi, the project consultant for the development of this ML map. Thank you, John. Yes. So uh, thank you for joining Mr. Tulsi to have this conversation about the ML map, uh, which uh, for those who don't know, is the Marine Litter Management Action Plan. Um, we know that marine litter is a major issue around St. Lucia and particularly plastic pollution is a huge environmental crisis across the world. So one of the things I guess we can start with is what is the intention behind the development of the ML map or what would it hope to achieve as you work on it? Yeah, thanks. I think yeah, that's a good place to start actually. Um, the Marine Litter Management Action Plan, as the name suggests, will be a national approach, a national strategy to address the problem of marine litter and in particular plastic pollution. Um, the, the idea is to really get a sense of the scope of the problem and that is why the first thing that was done was a national source inventory so that we could understand where this marine litter is coming from. And once you understand what the sources are, you could then develop the action plan which we are in the process of doing to address those sources and, and by extension to hopefully address the marine litter problem. Um, so really it's, it's the, the, the two activities go together, one informs the other and the idea is to address marine litter on the island. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you for that explanation. So. Um, like we noted at the start, marine litter being a major environmental crisis, it affects the ecosystems and our natural resources around St. Lucia. And understanding, like you said, the sources of, of that marine litter is one of the major uh, components or a good starting point, like you indicated. So can you give us an idea of what was found in, in the preparation of the National Source Inventory? Um, a number of very interesting things. Um, firstly, we are aware that all plastics, um, which is of greatest concern in terms of marine litter, are, is imported. Whether um, in preforms that nine local companies do um, use to produce consumer goods, or in items imported directly um, that goes onto the shelves, um, containers with um, consumer products like shampoos and those types of things um, and also in white goods or, or hard um, or IT equipment for example or even in vehicles that have a longer life so all plastics are imported um, that's the first thing that 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 we we realize the second thing is that 80 percent of marine litter comes from land-based sources. So managing marine litter for the most part means managing waste generally, solid waste. The other 20% approximately comes from activities at sea, whether it's fishing or, or um, shipping, um, you know, pleasure crafts, those types of things. Um, operations of oil rigs. We don't have much of that in St. Louis. We don't have any of that in St. Louis. But the other 20% comes from there. But what is makes the problem more difficult is that marine litter is a transboundary challenge. Not all the marine litter found in St. Lucian waters come from St. Lucia. And some of the marine litter that we generate may end up in coastlines 
far away from us. So it is also a transboundary problem. So the, the, the other important thing that came out of this study is that whereas the majority of the focus has to be on managing our own solid waste with 80 percent which contributes 80 percent to the marine litter mm -hmm. there also has to be international cooperation to deal with the transboundary aspect of the problem right that is definitely something that we um we would prioritize so we should prioritize then because mm -hmm. It is very interesting to find or to note, as you said, even though 80 percent is from land-based sources, we do have um, the sea-based <laughs> sources, yeah. to, I guess, put mm -hmm. it simply. Um, so thank you for, you know, highlighting those. And also, I, I note that you highlighted also the, the fact that you know, the plastics we have in St. Lucia, including the ones that end up in our marine spaces, are imported. So it's, it's definitely a major challenge um, because you cannot completely, or at least at the moment, moment, we cannot completely do away with all plastic imports. However, we have, uh, as a government, the government of St. Lucia has adopted a phased approach towards um, banning plastics, you know, in steps, uh, se mm -hmm. selected plastics and all styrofoam products um, under the Styrofoam and Plastic Food Service Containers Prohibition Act of 2019. So under this act, we have, um, like I said, selected plastic products, for example, PET1, HDP2, um, PS6 and uh, EPS6. These plastic products are uh, banned from being imported and all styrofoam products are banned from being imported into St. Lucia, mm -hmm. which would hopefully help to alleviate some of the, the issues of plastic pollution in our marine spaces that contributes to the marine litter mm -hmm. that we've been seeing. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm happy that you highlighted also that the plastics are imported and so we are uh, trying or taking steps towards reducing the amount of plastic we imported so that hopefully that will also address or reduce the amount of plastic ending up in the marine litter and overall reduce marine litter. Um, yeah. I think that was really a good um, move by the St. Lucia government to pass that Styrofoam Prohibition Act. Um, different plastics take different amounts of time to enter the waste stream. Um, I see you have on the, on the um, poster there that bo mm -hmm. water bottle. Um, <laughs> items like that enter the waste stream very quickly after purchase. Well, I mean, within days, perhaps, it enters the waste stream. You buy a bottle of water you, it, or a soft drink, you, you drink it and you get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Others like, um, let's say, cleaning products that come in plastic bottles, it may last six months, eight months. So, mm -hmm. and, and um, other items like, let's say, computers or the video camera that has a lot of plastic, that mm -hmm. will take years to enter the waste stream. So the timing of the entry into the waste stream is, is an important consideration. But what that act does is that it, it prohibits the importation, the use of single-use items. And these are items that enter the waste stream very quickly. And um, once there is this prohibition, then one will assume that one of two things are happening. Either they are no longer being imported, or if they are being imported, they will be intercepted by customs and discarded because it's prohibited. And if something is prohibited, it cannot enter, should not enter the island. Yeah. So one, whereas this study did not really look at the impact of the of the act as yet, um, one has to assume that there has been an immediate effect. And I think a look at the customs records can verify that. Right, definitely. It, and that would be uh, extremely interesting to note. And also, it would be interesting to note whether this uh, ban on, on those products has also led to change in behaviors, for example, per people purchasing more biodegradable and compostable materials. Mm -hmm. So that uh, we would 
assume that you know that is one of the effects as well and I guess it's it's it also highlights the need for general public and stakeholder involvement in ensuring that things like the the prohibition act um, and this ban on plastics are successful initiatives that achieve their outcomes because you I guess we cannot just do everything as just a government. We need the cooperation of the people. We need the St. Lucia Bureau of Standards, the Customs and Excise Department, the St. Lucia Manufacturers Association, um, Chamber of Commerce. We need that wide range of stakeholders to make sure that these things, um, make sure that the objectives of, of this kind of uh, action mm -hmm. are fully realized. So yeah, I, I agree with that absolutely. And, and, and the, the reality is that all of us generate waste. Almost every human activity generates waste. So that whereas you mentioned a whole list of stakeholders there, we've got to broaden that net to include every person. Every yes. person is a stakeholder in this. And, and how our relationship with waste and how we treat waste is at the center of the problem that we are trying to deal with. That is true. That is absolutely true. So we are hoping for that overall general community pull and cooperation, those synergies, um, to ensure that we are successful in these initiatives. And we're going to stick a pin in that for now uh, because we are due for a break. Uh, once again, you're watching TV30, a production of the Government Information S Service, and we will be back shortly after this break. Monsieur, they're really dirty. That cannot be healthy. Of course not, Garcia. Plastics are very bad for our environment. Look at this river, for example. It was once home to a number of different animals. It can take hundreds or even thousands of years for plastic to break down. And even when they break down, they do not disappear. Microplastics are tiny plastic particles that result from the breakdown of larger plastics. Microplastics can be harmful to animals and human health, especially since they contaminate our water supply and we end up consuming them when we eat fish that have fed on these tiny bits of plastic. To make matters worse, they are extremely difficult to remove from the water body. You know, people throw all kinds of things in the bush, gutters and ravines that end up in the rivers and the sea. Not only plastic, but glass, metal, old appliances like stoves and even old cars. Out of sight, out of mind. Hmm. Until the rains come and the gutters get blocked and the place floods, water in people's houses and shops and all over the road. Hmm. We in the same class castle. I know all of that. Tell me something I don't know. Irie. What's the ML map? El Malquisa? <laughs> it's the Marine Litter Management Action Plan. Where you get that from, partner? I, I never heard of that. My mother works at the Department of Sustainable Development. She told me that the ML map is an action plan for St. Lucia, which is meant to improve data, knowledge, and evidence on the sources, pathways, and the impacts of plastic pollution. Enhance understanding of the quantities and composition of marine litter and plastic pollution in St. Lucia. Improve coordination and cooperation among people at all levels working to address plastic pollution. And finally, to improve unity between national policies on waste management, marine litter, and plastic management and to get a better understanding of the opportunities they are to enhance teamwork when implementing marine litter and plastic reduction projects and activities. Oh, now I understand. 
it sounds like we will all have to work together to make the plan work. Not just the government, but also business places, the vendors, the bus drivers, the school children. But wow, I really wanted to go for a river bath today. For more information, contact the Department of Sustainable Development. Telephone 468 5833. Welcome back to TV30, a production by the Government Information Service. Um, we are discussing the National Source Inventory, NSI, and the Marine Litter Management Action Plan for St. Lucia, which is under a project that's being supported by the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, um, in collaboration with the Department of Sustainable Development and the St. Lucia Solid Waste Management Authority. Um, so we, under this project, have engaged various stakeholders, like we were saying, stakeholder engagement and establishing those synergies. It's one of the uh, major components of you know, ensuring that this entire um, project and all these plans to address marine litter in St. Lucia, making sure everyone is involved is one of the key um, points, the key mm -hmm. features. And to that end, we've been engaging uh, various persons in St. Lucia, various stakeholders, um, through the a technical con consultation workshop, uh, as well as the high level um, events, which was held in July. And we have an upcoming stakeholder seminar in October. So between all these events under the project, we uh, hopefully have a, a wide range of, of persons being engaged and being involved in this um, in this project in this ML map development and so I guess it would be probably a good point now to mention what are some of the key features and what would be some of the outcomes that we expect to get you know out of this ML map um, considering, you know, the involvement of all these various persons in, in the St. Lucian society. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, this whole process was very engaging. Um, of course, I work closely with the um, Department of Sustainable Development and Solid Waste Management Authority to identify the key stakeholders. The technical consultation that you mentioned was really the first of the activities right. under this project where we brought the key players together, and I think there was about more than 40 persons at that consultation, um, at which we went, discussed the problems that we were facing in terms of waste management, and in particular marine litter and plastic pollution. Um, and we spoke to the, the global nature of the problem, the fact that the UN, um, environmental um, okay. UNEP and, and the UNEA um, right. have I flagged this as a major global problem since 2014 when oh, the wow. UN Environment mm -hmm. a, um, Assembly had its first meeting mm -hmm. and throughout they have been building on on the initial recommendations so all of this was presented at that meeting and there was a rich exchange of views among those participants on, on how we should go about developing the inventory and the action plan. See, some very useful recommendations were made and, and, and resource materials were identified. That okay. led to a period of research and follow-up. There were, there were a number of one-on-one -on -one consultations and focus group consultations on various aspects of the um, of the the two outcomes mm -hmm. and that led to the production of the first draft of course of the of the two documents right. um, that was as you said presented at a high level meeting where we had policymakers i think there were six members of cabinet at that and oh, several yes. permanent secretaries and departmental yeah. heads yeah. where we presented the initial findings mm -hmm. And there was a rich exchange of views and a number of recommendations for changes. Mm -hmm. um, all of that was done, and um, 
the, the documents are nearing completion now, the, 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 the inventory mm -hmm. and the action plan are nearing completion and there will now be a, a final seminar where the, the updated versions will be presented to a wider cross-section and hopefully mm -hmm. get some useful recommendations. So, Mr. Tulsi, tell us more about the key findings um, in, in your observations. What have you found, what stands out or is highlighted? Mm, yeah. Firstly, if we talk about the sources of marine litter, um, I, guess I mentioned earlier about 80% 80, 80 comes from land-based sources. Um, litter that, and, and the primary source is from beach activities. Um, people leave their debris mm -hmm. on the beaches or near the beaches or maybe even in bags and their dogs get oh to yes. them and they're blown by the wind into the sea. Mm -hmm. Then um, there is a lot of marine litter that comes from streams and rivers and drains um, yes. that get washed into the ocean during high rainfall events. I'm sure mm -hmm. most persons are aware of that. Oh, yes. After high rainfall events, you see lots of debris, plastic bottles yeah. floating. Um, mm -hmm. And then there is illegal dumping along the coast. Um, mm -hmm. um, I could tell you, for example, that um, in Vifort, um, mm -hmm. the, peop um, the, the um, landfill, well, now it's a transfer point, um, mm -hmm. is not far from the Makuti mangrove. But instead oh. of people going to the, to the um, to the, play, the um, landfill mm -hmm. or the transfer point. They just drive into the mangrove and they, they dump oh, no. their waste there. And that again, during high rainfall events, will end up into the sea. Um, <clears throat> so at the end of the day, like I said, it is our how we as individuals, mm -hmm. and I also mean companies, corporations, um, people in the construction sector, how we manage waste is directly related to the amount of marine litter that we contribute. Oh, yes. <clears throat> and it's not only marine litter, it's litter generally. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so that, that was one of the interesting things that we found out during the research. The other mm -hmm. deals with the, the, the transboundary nature of the problem. <clears throat> During the, the research phase, there is an mm -hmm. island, an uninhabited island in the South Pacific, mm -hmm. where the, a university in Australia went and did some, some mm -hmm. research and coastal cleanup. Mm -hmm. And they did it annually, and mm -hmm. between two years, they collected 180 tons of plastic. Wow, on an uninhabited, on an uninhabited <laughs> island in wow. the South Pacific. So, so that, that did not come from the island, obviously. Yes. So it, it, it really highlights the nature of the problem. In the Caribbean, um, the University of Florida and UNEP did uh, some studies, and they found that on a typical Caribbean island, in one kilometer of coast, you find 2,000, 2,160 pieces of plastic. Globally, that figure is 517. So the Caribbean region is so much four times worse in terms of plastic pollution than the global average. So we have a serious problem in this part of the world in terms of how we manage our plastics. Um, there is some recovery and recycling, but it is not economical. Um, because the plastic is mixed with other waste. And yes. so the, the recycler has to collect the general waste and remove it. Um, mm -hmm. Initiatives like was done by Joe Kali and um, yes. <coughs> the, um, um, the OECS replast, replast project oh, yes. helps because that collects the plastics and, um, and makes the recycling, recovery and recycling more economical. Yeah. But those are not sustained. Mm -hmm. so, so there is a need to look at that as well. Um, and in thinking through this day, how we deal with this, uh, mm -hmm. the, 
and based on the recommendations that we got, there are five pillars, as we call them, on which the, the marine litter management action plan is built. The yeah. first is the policy and the regulatory framework. The, the Styrofoam Prohibition Act is an ex excellent example of how a law can change the dynamics. Um, mm -hmm. So it is recommending that a number of things be done, like there is the um, Returnable Containers Bill, which I think oh, yeah. was is being um, modified by the Department of Sustainable Development. Mm -hmm. That can make a big difference. Um, and there is also the whole question of waste from ships and, and mm -hmm. that needs to be regulated. Yes. So, so the first pillar really looks at the policy and the regulatory framework that is in place to, to uh, manage waste. And yes. by managing waste, we, by extension, manage marine litter. Yes. The other is waste minimization. Mm -hmm. What can we do to minimize the amount of waste that we generate? And um, the number of recommendations are made. Um, in terms of re recovery and reuse of, of items. Um, there is the whole question of waste segregation. If we could do that and minimize the amount of waste that goes to the landfill, because by segregating waste, you could then pull out the recyclables. Right. Okay? Yes. Um, so there's a whole waste minimization aspect to this. There is also, um, <coughs> excuse me, stakeholder engagement. Oh, yes. um, you mentioned stakeholders um, right. while we were talking about this. Yes. At the end of the day, everyone generates waste. Therefore, everyone is a stakeholder. Right. Yeah. Yes, that's and why things like the upcoming stakeholder seminar, uh, which will take place on the 6th of October, uh, these kinds of things are so important because it pulls together you know, the CSOs, um, civil society organizations, different uh, national non-governmental organizations, agencies, government departments, it pulls everyone together to make sure that they can then take the messages that you will be presenting as the facilitator at that seminar. Uh, they mm -hmm. can take those back to their departments, back to their organizations and to their communities so that we can have that wide uh, range and level of support all across St. Lucia. So definitely mm -hmm. it is something I'm glad you mentioned, you know, one of the key pillars is that stakeholder engagement, which is one of the things we continuously mm -hmm. want to tie into this plan. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And uh, <coughs> in terms of stakeholders, we must not forget international stakeholders, oh, yes. entities like UNEP, the IUCN, and a number of other um, intergovernmental organizations and also bilateral assistance with friendly governments. They are an important stakeholder in this. Um, uh, yes. Um, I thank you so much, Mr. Tulsi, for all those contributions. I know you, I, I don't know if you want to go on and briefly mention the other two pillars. Uh, you've mentioned three so far, uh, but we do unfortunately have to wrap up this conversation. Yeah, I'll just, so, so I'll just mention one quickly and it's behavioral yes. change. Oh yes, <coughs> and um, important. Because at the end of the day, if individuals and organizations can, can change their behavior in terms of how they manage waste, um, then I think the problem will be solved. But oh, unless yes. that, that education component transitions into behavioral change, I think this problem will continue to persist. That is true. Yeah. And that is something we would definitely like to address in this entire project at all points uh, as we go through it. So thank you so much for you know highlighting those pillars and for all the, the information that you've shared about the NSI, about the ML map, um, the Marine Litter Management Action Plan. Uh, so thank you for all the work you've done as the project consultant, Mr. Tulsi, you have been very dedicated to this cause and we at the department greatly appreciate it. Um, so thank you, thank you for this interview and thank you to the viewers for joining us on TV30, a production by the Government Information Service. I have been your host, Joanne Norville, Science and Technology Officer in the Department of Sustainable Development, joined by, again, Mr. Vishnu Tulsi, the project consultant for this Marine Litter Management Action Plan project. Um, thank you.
uh, no. for joining us. And we, if anyone would like more information about the ML map, you can always contact the Department of Sustainable Development, reach out to us, uh, and look out for updates on social media and in the news. Um, I guess with that, we close off. Thank you to all. <laughs>